Welcome back to History of Christianity. It's great to have you here today in class. Today we are going to be looking at an interesting area of the world in northeastern Turkey in an area called Cappadocia. And out of Cappadocia came a couple of early church fathers uh, called the Cappadocians. It's going to be uh, actually a sister, two brothers, and then a friend. And they were very impactful on uh, Christianity, on um, how things were done in the church, uh, some theology. So um, we're going to be looking at the Cappadocians today. And then we're going to continue on with uh, Ambrose of Milan, another well-known uh, patristic. So stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, this is the PowerPoint portion of our lecture on the Cappadocians and Ambrose. Uh, Cappadocia, you can see it there on the map. That's in uh, modern-day Turkey, uh, up on the north northeastern uh, portion of that uh, area uh, that borders uh, the Black Sea. So that's where we're talking about right now. Okay, the Cappadocians, uh, three leaders or four. Uh, I put it that way because uh, Macrina, which is a sister of Basil and Gregory of Nyssa, um, is not attributed to being one of the Cappadocian fathers. Uh, but she was uh, extremely influential in the beginning of the Cappadocian uh, movement. So I put her on there for four leaders, Macrina, sister of Basil and Gregory of Nyssa, Basil of Caesarea, a.k.a. Basil the Great, and Gregory of Nyssa. And those three, Macrina, Basil, and Gregory of Nyssa, uh, they were brothers and sister. And then Gregory of Nazianzus, who was a friend of theirs. So these are uh, viewed as the leaders for the Cappadocians. Okay, so we'll just start and go down this list of leaders. Uh, Macrina, uh, born around 330 A.D. She died July 19th, 379 A.D. She was sister of Basil and Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, the family was two generations of Christians, so there was persecution that took place in this family. Uh, Macrina was set, and she was very happy, to marry a lawyer. But he died just before the wedding, and she decided, that's it, I'm going to vow my life to celibacy. And there's a, uh, a, a very old um, painting of her. Now, Basil went away for his education and returned prideful and vain. And Macrina uh, confronted him on his pride. It was not until uh, an unexpected death of another brother that Basil ends up repenting. Now, Macrina was the lead comforter of the family, and she influenced them to sell everything and retreat to a monastic life in the wilderness near the Black Sea. And she went, and many women actually joined her. Basil decides he's going to go to Egypt and study the monastic life there. And Macrina, she becomes simply known as the teacher. Okay, so she was very influential in the family and the beginning of monasticism uh, of the Cappadocian, um, of the Cappadocians. Okay, so that was that was the sister. Now we're going to talk about Basil the Great. Basil the Great, three thirty A.D. to January second, three seventy nine. Uh, Basil returned from Egypt and settled into a monastic life with his friend, Gregory of Nazianzus, which is um, uh, the friend uh, in that list. It was the last Cappadocian father. Uh, Basil wrote rules for monastic life, and he was is viewed as the father of Eastern monasticism. So when the rules were written, it kind of outlined how a monastery should run and what the monks should do in this monastic life. He traveled to Caesarea to deal with Arianism, of which he opposed. And while he was there, the bishop of Caesarea died. And Basil the Great was elected bishop of Caesarea uh, while there. And there's a picture of him on the right. Well, while he's there, there's this confrontation with Emperor Valen, 
who was Arian. He followed the Arian beliefs, and he came to Caesarea to give a large offering. And Valen was actually made to wait for uh, Bishop Basil. And this is important because this event that took place, it deals with, with positioning of almost a positioning of power because what happened was the emperor was made to wait and had to basically submit to, uh, to the priest or to the bishop. And um, Basil then came out after this waiting period and, and the um, emperor had to wait. Basil comes out and accepts the gift. And so there's this like power positioning that is going on. And you'll see this throughout history, this positioning of power with church leaders over the uh, civil leaders and there's other, obviously other times when civil leaders are over the, the church. But um, it go, kind of goes back and forth. There's, there's power position play, plays that are going on. And here uh, with Valen and Basil, uh, definitely one is played out. Uh, Basil spent the rest of his life organizing monastic life, so the organization of monasteries. And he also contributed to the doctrine of the Trinity. Died just before the Council of Constantinople in 381. Uh, the... Con Council of Constantinople was another council that confirmed the Nicene Council. You see in the painting there, Emperor Valens before the Bishop Basil by Pierre Sublaris, 1699 to 1749, so a later artwork. But Basil uh, is right here. He, he's the old man up here at the top of the steps. And down here is Emperor Valens in this red, uh, red robe. Okay, the next is Gregory of Nyssa, younger brother to Basil and Macrina, uh, 335 to 395 AD. There's a picture of him. Uh, he wanted a quiet, solitude Christian life with no great interest in any controversy. He just wanted to be left alone to do his thing, worshiping God. Uh, he got married and had a happy life. Later, after his wife died, he lived uh, monastically. Uh, he became very known for his mysticism, and throughout history, again, in church history, uh, there's these um, spurts or movements of, of mystical belief, mysticism, which is a kind of a deep contemplation uh, that can bring an experience with God. It comes to an experiential type of worship, uh, and it's, it's like a mystical worship. Uh, but So he becomes involved in that. After Valen uh, split Cappadocia, so we have that region that I showed you on the map, Valen, Emperor Valen, he split that into two provinces. Basil supported Gregory to become the bishop of Nyssa, which is a new, it was a new say. Uh, a say is kind of like a religious uh, jurisdiction. And, and uh, Basil wanted uh, Gregory to become the bishop of Nyssa. And there's the picture of him, 11th century mosaic in St. Sophia Cathedral in Ukraine. Uh, he was on the Council of Constantinople and confirmed Orthodox beliefs. Um, the belief that he really pushed was God is one essence in three persons. So we have you know, God, the triune Godhead, one God in three persons. Became theological advisor to Emperor Theodosius and traveled throughout the empire to promote Orthodox beliefs. And then he returned to monastic life until his death. So the, he was one of the Cappadocians that spread around the empire, taking the, the orthodox belief, the accepted the belief, the, the true belief, uh, and spreading that around. And then our last Cappadocian father here is Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, 329 to 390 AD, uh, son of a bishop. And when I put in parentheses there, uh, bishops at this time were often married, Okay, it's later on that the clergy of the Catholic Church, or they're where they're celibate. The monks were definitely uh, looked at as being celibate, but um, he's a son of a bishop. Uh, he was good friends with Basil the Great. He joined Basil at his monastic community and became ordained presbyter of Nazianzus. There, while there, he wrote on pastoral responsibilities. And so you see all of these fathers, they have their own, their own uh, little, uh, little thing that they did for the church, whether it be monastic rules or spreading the message around the empire, or in this case, writing down pastoral responsibilities. And these things would become the, the foundation of how the church would function uh, in the future. 
There's Gregory here in this painting, Gregory the Theologian. That's in Dorm Dormitian Cathedral, painted around 1408 A.D. Uh, Basil made him bishop of a small area, which Gregory did not want. Uh, there was a strained relationship over this, and Basil died with no reconciliation. And that made Gregory upset. So to make up for this to his friend who died, Gregory took the lead against Arianism. In 380, he went to Constantinople as Emperor Theodosius made a triumphal entry. Gregory and Theodosius visited a cathedral together, and as they exited, a sunbeam shone down through the clouds, and it, it was shining on Gregory. And the people became overwhelmed with this, and they started chanting uh, that Gregory Bishop, Gregory Bishop. They looked at it as a sign from God that Gregory should be the next bishop. Theodosius, the emperor, he approved and made Gregory, made Gregory Bishop of Constantinople. And he was there that for a little while, but then he actually resigned from the bishopric, and he returned to his pastoral duties. Okay, so that was the Cappadocians. And now we're just going to shift shift gears here. It's still the same kind of time period, but now we're going to look over in northern Italy at a very well-known uh, church father named Ambrose, Ambrose of Milan. And there's a, a mosaic of him. Okay, so some background. Ambrose of Milan. Uh, the bishop of Milan, who was Arian, uh, he dies. And the city was in turmoil for who would be the next bishop. And it was leading to that possibly riots would occur in Milan. Well, Ambrose was actually the governor of Milan. He wasn't a priest yet or anything like that. He was the governor. He was trained his education in rhetoric, so the art of debate, the art of speech. And he was actually hoping for a higher place in the empire. He, he had a civil occupation and he wanted to move higher up in the civil government to become higher in the empire. Well, he goes and he calms everybody down. Here, he's the good governor, Ambrose, and he calms everybody down. And as he's calming everybody down, the, suddenly the crowds, they began to chant, Ambrose Bishop, Ambrose Bishop. And he tries to dissuade the people. No, that's not for me. That's not my plan. I'm, I'm, I'm not looking to be a bishop. But the crowd persisted, and Ambrose tried to flee the city. Well, word got to the emperor, who was Valentinian I at this time, and the emperor was pleased for one of his governors to be a bishop. He, he liked this idea. So because the emperor wants it to happen, good governor Ambrose, he decides, okay, I will be the bishop of Milan. But the thing was, was he had never been baptized. And so on December 1st, 373, uh, he was baptized and made bishop of Milan. Well, this new bishop, Ambrose, knowing that he doesn't have a strong theological foundation, he throws himself into studying theology under the tutelage of several priests. Now, he supported the orthodox beliefs. He, he rejected Arianism. Well, while he's the uh, the bishop there in Milan, in northern Italy, it's kind of near, it's getting up there towards the, the fringes of the empire. If you remember on that map, it's kind of up there in the north and, and the farther northeast, there's going to be the barbarians, we would call them. Well, the, the Goths attack nearby. So that's a group of people that are up there on the fringes. They're looked at as barbarians, the Goths. They attacked nearby, and a bunch of refugees fled that area and ran into Milan. So you have a bunch of refugees in the city. And Ambrose, he starts to care for them, but he needed money to do this, so he, he melts down gold from church vessels, from vases or goblets or whatever. He melts that down, and he actually used that money to free captives, to free the people that have been captured by the barbarians. Well, he is heavily criticized for doing this. And he came back and said, Should it be, would, shouldn't we be more concerned with the Lord's souls than with the Lord's gold? And he got the point across. That it's, it's not about the gold, it's about saving the people. So um, that was just a little event in his, in his life there. 
Uh, his name spread around. He became very, very well known. He wrote on theology and he wrote on the duties of pastors. And again, these kind of writings, they kind of become established and accepted. And sometimes it just goes on for centuries, people following uh, the writings and theology uh, that is written down. Uh, many came to listen to him preach. And this is very interesting because, remember, he was trained in rhetoric, so he, he was a very good public speaker. He's preaching the Word of God, and something very interesting happens. You see there in the, the bullet point there towards the bottom. After a long spiritual pilgrimage, a young man arrives to hear Ambrose preach. Afterwards, Ambrose baptizes him. And for dramatic effect, I said, his name is Augustine of Hippo. So Ambrose baptized Augustine of Hippo. And Augustine, very well-known theologian, we're going to have a whole lecture just on him coming up. So um, it's very important to know that Ambrose, who was a governor, became a priest, uh, uh, became a, uh, the bishop of Milan. And in his preaching, he preaches to Augustine. Augustine says, I want to be baptized, and he baptizes Augustine. Ambrose and the emperors. Uh, we have a little uh, story here uh, with Ambrose dealing with uh, emperors, uh, or some backstory first. The next emperor, Valentinian II, was a boy, and he was threatened by Maximus, who was uh, in charge over in the eastern part of the empire. Uh, Valentinian's mother, Justina, reached out to Ambrose for help. But they clashed because Justina was Arian and wanted an Arian basilica built for Arians to worship in. And Ambrose refused, and so tensions were elevated. So the emperor is a boy. Mom wants some help from the church. But because she's Arian and wants this basilica built... Ambrose says no, and there's problems. However, during this time, Ambrose had a burial ground dug up, and two skeletons were found. After being attributed to two martyrs, that's very convenient, two martyrs, all of a sudden, miracles started to occur. So, because of this, this uh, tension with the emperor, and he's like, he's like pushing back against the civil authorities who were following unorthodox belief, and now we have these miracles occurring, Ambrose has more support than ever. He was just, like, uh, really popular. So Justina ends up backing down, which makes the empire or the emperor look weak. Eventually, Maximus would defeat Valentinian II, and in turn, he was then defeated by Theodosius. You don't need to know all of that. It's just that there's... Ambrose is involved in this kind of back and forth of the empire. Emperor Theodosius defended orthodox beliefs and had a cordial relationship with Ambrose, especially after the Council of Constantinople in 381, where the, a lot of orthodox beliefs were firmly rooted and firmly grounded as the belief of the empire. And then Ambrose, he ends up dying April 4th, 397 AD, which was Easter Sunday. Okay, so that's uh, the Cappadocians and Ambrose. Okay, class, that's it for today. Uh, next time, we're going to be looking at uh, two other church fathers. We're going to be looking at a man named John Chrysostom. I mean, you may have heard of him, uh, John Chrysostom. And also uh, Jerome, you may have heard of him. They were very influential with their writings and their leadership of the church during the patristic period. Mm -hmm.